Okay, we better get started. Some people at least online as well. And I hope a few more people will come in. So let's get started. Um, this is on, yeah. Okay. So last time, last time we were looking at this data frame, which is this tabular data structure. Now I'm just going to run some code from the top of this um, so that we can continue. So we need some of this stuff. So if you remember, we had this, this data set from, oh, this is the wrong directory. No, this is correct. Um, we had this data set with um, athlete data in it from, I think it was the Olympic Games. And I'll just pick that data back up again. Um, and we're just sort of showing you some kind of functionality of this tabular data structure called the data frame. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to keep doing that this time and we'll get more into analysis. So like asking questions of what's in here in this data and making some summaries of it. So let me find where we're up to. I think we're up to simple analysis. So that's good. Okay. Oh, and there's one other thing I need to run as well. We had the original data frame contained data from, um, where is it? Okay, here it is, athlete data. Yeah, so the original one contained multiple rows for every athlete, one for each competition or something. So this one's just computing like an, unicifying it based on the athlete's ID, which is not the name, like the name could be unique. The no, you could do it based on the name, but then you would obviously have some people who had the same name. So using the ID instead. Okay, so simple analysis. Okay, so um, yeah, here's an example of what we might want to do. So if we've got this athlete DF and we've got the size of that, um, that had 135,000 entries in it <clears throat> and 15 columns. So every row was something about an athlete. Hello, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, every row was something about an athlete and every column, uh, like every row was an athlete and every column was something about that athlete. So we could find the names of the columns and this is what we have about them. There's an ID, name, sex, age, height, weight, all those things. <clears throat> okay, um, so we might want to know like what was the um number of um male athletes. They so we could do this to get that. Is that big enough? It's not very big. Let's make that a bit bigger. Um so this would count. Okay, does do people actually know what is going on here? This is maybe not as not that obvious. Um, does anybody actually know what this is doing? Like, yes, it's counting all the guys. Um, yeah, it's kind of doing that. Yeah, so it's kind of applying this function here to every um, element and then summing it. Um, actually, you could think of it that way, but it doesn't actually compute those intermediate data structures. So we could think of it doing this. So we apply the equals equals function that dot means do it for every element. We could think of that kind of thing. And then we get our array of ones and zeros, and then we sum that up. That's basically what's happening. But um, instead of constructing this array, which this expression would, uh, it does the sum as it computes this equality. So it's a bit more efficient. Um, and the other thing I'd like to point out is that this thing here, which I think is pretty obscure syntax actually, <laughs> um, is some shorthand for making a function um, which compares a thing you give it to M. <laughs> so this is, this is some function, F equals this thing. And then we can, we can calculate F of this and we get false and f of m and we get true. So um, let's look at that another way. Um, I, I just feel like this is kind of obscure syntax. So in fact, let's let's write it 
Ooh. Let's write it this way. So you could write it this way as well. So you're applying this function, which is the sex of the athlete goes to um, whether it's equal to M or not. Um, so you get true or false out of that. So you apply that to every element in this array and then you count the results where it's true. So yeah, that's what's actually happening. Um, so yeah, likewise, you could count uh, the number of F. Um, so yeah, there's a lot less female athletes overall in this data set. Um, yeah, and that's all well and good, but there's a more convenient, often you might want to do both of those groups at once. So there's actually a more convenient way of doing that kind of thing, which is to group by this, this sex field. And then you end up with two groups in this case, or maybe more like in principle, there could be more genders or whatever they count they have in this data set. Well, we don't know yet, actually, there could be, but um, we are going to find out. So to do that, we could use the group count function from split apply combine .jl. Just let me check. Yeah, okay. Now he's yeah. Okay, so yeah, we could we could use this group count function. Um, so that's a convenience function. This is just like a very common thing to want to do um, to group by something and then count the number of things in each group. So that's what this function does. So that's why there's like a very specific function for this because it's like really common to want to do it. Um, and in that case, we're getting out this dictionary which maps um, M to that number and F to that number. Um, so we could in fact do this. Oops. And we could we could look up based on this key here sorry, the key on the left-hand side, we could look up the values on the right-hand side. And you'll notice that this is a dictionaries dot dictionary, which is not base dot dict. Um, so it turns out that the base dot dict dictionary data structure is actually pretty bad for data analytics. Um, it doesn't, well, it's not ideal. It doesn't have good properties in terms of um, broadcast and like some other things you might want to do when you're doing data analytics. Um, so um, Andy, who taught who taught this course the last couple of years, who taught this section, um, actually made this package dictionaries, um, and it's a lot better for data analytics. Um, so yeah, if you do a bit of data analytics in Julia, you'll often see people using dictionaries instead of the base dictionary, which is a little unfortunate because Julia is very much a, a data kind of language. It would be nice if the base dictionary had those properties, but. We will see maybe in the future we can make that happen. It's a long-term project. Okay, anyway. Um, so yeah, we that's like not that exciting, I guess, but we could do more interesting things like for instance, um, group count the um, athletes by the team they're on. So here we go. Um, and we've got a bunch of things. Um, the largest ones, actually, no, we don't know the largest one in this case. This is just a bit of a random order at, at this point. Um, and I think we can sort it, which is the next thing on the list there. Um, and we could find out what the largest was, which is the United States. Um, another thing I'd like to point out here as well is that if you look at some of the examples of the names of the teams in here, you can see that they're not that helpful. I, like what is dash three? What does that even mean? Um, so that's like actually pretty common um, in data analysis. You'll find that there's a lot of funny like data. There's some cases where this is probably an error or like an obscure way that this data was entered when this data was originally created. Um, and you'd normally need to do what's called a data cleaning step where you would fix all of those weird things about the data before you can actually make good kind of analysis on top of it. Um, so yeah, probably in this case, you'd have to go through and strip off all the dash, whatever number, and also maybe figure out what that even means so that you know that you're doing the right thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So that is pretty common. Or maybe you would just filter out all of those, those ones with the funny dashes. Who knows? And we'll see a way of doing that later. <clears throat> um, yeah, so... 
like one of the things that you might want to do after you've grouped things by the team name is to count the number of things in that group, but you might want to do other things. Um, one example is to just collect all of those athlete names um, into like a big, a big list, a big array, I guess. So there's another, uh, there's a more flexible fun uh, function called group. Um, which allows you to give the thing that you want to group by and then another another vector, which is the same length, um, which are things to collect into that group. So we can do that. And these functions, by the way, are coming from split, apply, combine, I think. Let's check. We can look at group. Uh, in fact, this is not told us, so we could try parent module. We want to find out where that comes from. So yes, in fact, it comes from split, apply, combine. <clears throat> Another way to, to do that might be to look at the, the um, methods. Although this can be confusing because model packages might define methods. So the function itself arises from split, apply, combine.jl. OK, anyway, to get back to the data, um, you can see that um, yeah, in this case, we've got uh, we've got this this grouped like each each team is now a big list of athletes um, on the right hand side. So if we were to look up that group by the China um, key, then we would find this uh, two thousand five hundred length vector of people's names. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, we might also want to preserve the other attributes. So in this case, we've kind of lost, we've lost a lot of information here. We've only just got the, the names left after we do this grouping. Um, so it can be really useful to kind of keep the data frame data structure as you process the data. And that's um, the data frames itself provides a lot of different utility functions to let you keep the data frame data structure while you do data analysis. So this is an example of doing that. So we could group this DF, this data frame, this table thing um, by, okay, that's not very easy to read. Let me make that a bit bigger. Um, hopefully this might be easier. Yeah, there we go. So um, yeah, in that case, we grouped it, oh, we grouped it by, by, sorry, by the team. And there's 1,013 groups. And then you can think of this as like a, a list of data frames. So there's the first group, which has the team name China, and the last one, which has China 3 in it. Well, OK, that's that's kind of weird, as we saw before. Um, yeah, but um, so you, you can think of it as a list of data frames, um, but it preserves extra information like what it was grouped by. Um, and that allows us to apply some further functions on top of that to summarize the data. Yeah, that's just showing the same thing, I think. Last row is China 3. <clears throat> um, and there's a bunch of like specialized functionality within data, um, dataframes.jl. So uh, there's this combine function, which I don't know, it's probably, it, it's pretty powerful function. <laughs> we'll see the detail, a bit more detail about what this does later on. Um, but um, yeah, more or less it's for computing something over the data frame and then creating some entirely new columns and throwing the other ones away. Uh, so we could do that. Oh, we didn't assign this thing. So, uh, so GDF, that's going to be our groups. And then we can go combine this thing. And then uh, this is a specialized bit of syntax which says, that the number of rows in each of these groups is going to become a new column called count. Um, so that's what we've got there. So now we've still got a data frame, um, but in this new data frame, we've thrown away all of the columns from our old one, <clears throat> and we've computed the summary for each group. Um, and we will see lots of different ways of like, computing summaries. Yeah. Um, I think it's worth noting that um, data frames has kind of invented a whole bunch of syntax for its own use. So this kind of this kind of stuff here um, is it's a little very, bit idiosyncratic. It's um, 
rather specialized to data frames, like outside the data ecosystem, you won't see uh, some of the syntax that we're going to see here. Um, but so it's like a little bit of a world of its own in terms of syntax. Like this arrow is normal Julia syntax. And in fact, I can demonstrate that, that thing. That is just a pair. Um, that's just syntax for a pair. This is part of base. So this is definitely normal Julia syntax. Um, but the way that data frames uses it <clears throat> is um, it's pretty specialized and like kind of unique to the data the data ecosystem in Julia. Um, yeah, so I, I find that a little bit unsatisfying, um, but it does it does lead to some really concise syntax. Um, and once you get used to it, it's really efficient to use. Okay, so um, let's just talk a bit a bit more about like. Uh, like how data frames work, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so we've seen that they're this tabular data structure and they have columns which are named and rows which have an index. Um, so internally, uh, it can be important to know what's going on internally in this data structure. Um, and so the way it's actually stored is a, co a column-based format where each, uh, <clears throat> each of the columns is just a vector. So if we were pulling out the height, um, then internally inside the data frame itself, this is actually the representation. We didn't compute this, we just pulled it out. So this is completely free basically to pull out an individual column. There's no compute computation involved in doing that. Um, so if you need to access columns and do things based on columns, then data frames is a very good data structure. Oh geez, I need to, sorry about that, just turn that off. Thanks. Um, let's, let's, I'll just, uh, do, do not disturb. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so columns are like column based operations are fast. Um, on the other hand, if you want to talk about rows of the data frame, there's some computation involved. So if you were to look at the first row, so like, um, we've seen that data frames is like this tabular thing. Like, so conceptually it's got, it's got, um, like cells, I guess, like a spreadsheet or something, um, and you index, um, uh, you index like the first cell, for instance, that's not very interesting, is it? What have we got? Um, yeah. So like the second, the second column, um, is the, is the names. So like, it's kind of like this two-dimensional data structure. Um, and so if you wanted to view it instead as like a vector, a list of the rows, you can use this is each row function. So that doesn't look, look that different, but it's made this data frame rows data structure. And we could pull out the first row by just indexing the first row like that. And we'll see that that's just a single row and um, you can also use like the rest of the Julia functions, which deal with one dimensional data structures. Like you can use first on that thing, or you could use last on it. Let's use last. So we could get the last row out. So yeah, if you want to look at the data frame as, as, as a list of rows, then you can use each row. Um, the only issue with doing that is, um, yeah, like, as I said, it's a column based data structure internally. So this needs to do some actual work to maybe compute this concrete row from um, like pulling things out of the columns. Um, and also like we did see some indexing, I think before, but we can get the first uh, row and the entire uh, set of columns. That's what the column is, just like a matrix. Um, so that's another way of looking at that. So you can kind of just choose like which way, which kind of way you want to, um, which syntax you want to use. <clears throat> Yeah, okay, so I think I talked about that. Basically, it's it's column-based. Um, uh, yeah, and so like maybe that's the thing you want. And often doing data analytics, you really you really want column-based storage. Um, but there are cases where you want something row-based. And um, like a pretty typical example of that, it would be like a transactional database um, type situation. Um, like there isn't, like you wouldn't be building one of these necessarily in Julia, but um, if you did have, say, a traditional SQL database, um, uh, then 
uh, yeah, they, they generally store data based on the rows. And that's because the typical workload that this kind of data structure is meant to service is that like someone adds one single element to that collection. Like they add a single row of information um, to the relation. So, or they delete the single row. So that kind of thing has to be really efficient. And it also needs to be um, like not just efficient, um, but you need to be able to do that um, like often concurrently. Um, so lots and lots of um, requests might be coming to the database. So yeah, that that kind of likes just an optimization for that kind of um, workload. Um, yeah, but so like say in Julia, you actually wanted to uh, view your data as a, just a list of, of rows. Um, so you don't need to use data frames and these other packages for this. There's a very simple built-in data structure. I think we've seen this before. Um, this kind of thing, we could go name. So like this this um, name tuple data structure. Um, you can get out uh, like a list of these things directly from the CSV file by just basically saying for every record, that, that syntax just means for every record in this CSV file, we're going to turn it into a name tuple. Um, and that looks like a big mess, it kind of is. Um, but we could get we could get the first one of those. So then that would be like a row-based view of the data. So there you go, there's the first one. Um yeah, so there's like some built-in data structures within Julia which you could you could use um, to do data analysis with. Depends on your use case and like how lightweight you want to be with it. Um yeah, and like yeah, this is just sort of saying, yeah, if if you don't want to if you don't if you've got a tiny bit of analysis to do you don't want to have a lot of dependencies in your your project um yeah you could just use those built-in kind of types um yeah there's another package which is a really neat little package called type tables uh, which has an interface like this row based storage so when you index it it behaves as if it's rows but for efficiency the actual internal storage is columns so Whereas when you have a data frame, and I think this is more a historical thing than anything, um, it's viewed as kind of this two-dimensional data structure. But I think for data analytics, it would actually make more sense to use, um, to, to see the data as the way that type tables does, which is um, to have, let's just make this table. Yeah, so. It's it's like it's got a slightly different way of printing the data, but so it'll print it like a table. But um, if we go t equals this thing, and then we look at the very first row in there, we get a named tuple out of it. Um, yeah. So, and there's other things that are nice about this. If we're looking at it as a as a I spelled it wrong, didn't I? Um, if we're looking at it as a list of rows, then the length of that makes sense. It's just the number of records. Um, whereas the length of a data frame is not defined because we're sort of looking at it as a matrix, kind of. <laughs> um, so I'd say conceptually, this is like a very lean way of looking at it. But um, I would also say that data frames itself, and that's what we're about to talk a lot about, just using data frames, um, data frames has kind of got a lot of community momentum behind it and has a lot of convenience packages which go with it. So if you just want to get your data analysis done, it's pretty good to just go for it. Yes. Um, oh, we're looking at this, looking at these things, you mean, in this? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think those things might be coming from CSV files. Um, I'm not sure what this knock is. Um, or did we? No, yeah, and, and that's actually a good question. Um, so those string data types, what they will be is, <clears throat> um, when you have a bunch of short strings, which is like really common in data analysis, you'll have some people's names or you'll have uh, maybe more relevant, you'll have things which are like cities or something like that. 
um, they tend to be pretty categorical data. They they have a small number of values and they um, generally tend to be short strings as well. So it might be much more efficient to just store those strings as like a maximum fixed maximum length string. That's what they use internally. So when you see something like this, um, oh, sorry, this was T of one or something. We were seeing that, weren't we? Um, dot, which one is it? Knock, I don't know. City, yeah, dot city. Um, yeah, so that's a string 31. Um, so you can see where that's coming from, hopefully. Oh, it's inline strings. Okay, so there's a package called inline strings.jl. And I think that CSV files is using that to make it more efficient. Um, so yeah, it's way more efficient if you know the maximum length of your string um, to store the data that way. So that's probably what's going on there. Um, but the interface of that string should be the same as the interface of the normal string. So it's it's like from your point of view as a data analysis person, it doesn't matter. It's just your data analysis is going to go faster. Okay. Um, yeah, so like there are a bunch of different data analysis packages. Um, data frames, I would say, is probably the most popular. Um, there's another one called query.jl. So if you like writing SQL syntax, um, then you can use query.jl. And there's another couple which are similar to that. Um, and you can use that to construct sort of data summaries out of your tabular data. Um, so yeah, you can use whichever ones you want. Um, but what we're going to do in the rest of this is we're going to really talk about data frames. And I think. Like while it's not the most maybe conceptually um, like pleasing data analysis package, it's definitely the most well used. So you have all of the bits and pieces at your fingertips, and there's like more documentation that kind of thing. So it's a pretty good choice if you're just trying to get some data analysis done. <clears throat> right. So I think we show this last time, but um, yeah, to, you can construct a data frame directly. So we're just going to use these tiny little data frames, a couple of tiny little ones, um, to show some um, more features about data frames.jl. Uh, so this one's like a tiny little one with some column names A and B and has three rows. Um, I think we've seen this that Oh yeah, we, we've seen that you can get we can get columns out, but we I don't know if we saw that you can set columns. So you can make new columns and you can make a new column like this. Um, and if you would try and make one that's too long, I imagine it will be an error. It should be an error. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. You have to have the length of all the columns the same. It's not going to chop them off for you or anything funny. Yeah, so anyway, that's mutating. So we've just changed our data frame got three columns now. Okay, we've already seen that can be indexed with like integers, but you can also index it with, so if we want the first row, we saw that before, could do this, um, but we can index the columns with a name. So we could get C out, uh, the, like the Cth column <laughs> and the first row. Um, and it also supports fancy indexing in the same way that matrices do. So like if you supply some indices for the columns, which can be the names of those columns, then you can pull out just those columns and this first row in this case. Um, or you could like pull out the second and third row. So we could go from two to three. That's the range from two to three. And we could pull out those columns with those names. And that would just pull out a little chunk of the, the data frame. Okay. So yeah, there's lots of stuff. Um, if you think of it like a matrix, it's pretty similar in terms of its um, its interface. Okay. So the filter function. Um, so say you wanted to, um, like we had before, look for all of the, the females or whatever in that data set. Or in this case, we just want to find the rows which where A is odd. Um, we can use the filter function. 
Um, so this is a bit of an oddity, I would say. Like we're talking about data frames as if they're um, two-dimensional, but then this is assuming, like this is this is kind of saying, oh, no, actually it's a one-dimensional thing. It's a collection of rows. And what we're going to do is apply this generic function called filter, which uh, I think, did we see filter before? I'm sure we did. Okay, so let's let's do it at a simpler one. Um, so if we wanted to filter um, just all of the odd numbers out of all of the minus all of the things between um, one and and thirty or something, and um, we could do that. So what this does is it uh, takes some array, some vector or iterator really in general, anything that can be iterated. Um, and it applies this predicate here, which computes a true or thing, false thing. And then it takes all the results, which were true. So that's what's going on. Um, so in an analogy, we could, if we were looking at our data frame as a uh, collection of rows, then we could apply this function here, which says that row, um, for each row, we compute whether A in that row is odd. And we apply that function to each row and we just take the ones which are true. We could say that um, that's the opposite of that, like the, the false one, the, um, the even ones. Okay. Okay. Um, that's not necessarily the most efficient thing um, because uh, data frames itself is a kind of uh, dynamic data structure where you can add these columns and the compiler might not be able to figure out what the type of this row.a is if this row here is constructed dynamically. Um, so, uh, so yeah, like you may have to construct every single row and then you're taking only one element out of that and then checking it whether something's true or false. So then you throw the row away and then you put the result into like, you keep the, the filtering function keeps that in the, in the output. Um, so to make that sort of more efficient, but also just easier to write, um, data frames itself defines a special version of filter. And like I was saying before, data frames has this, the package itself has this sort of world of its own syntax. And here's a bit of that syntax. So this, funny thing here says, um, for the column A, apply the function on the right-hand side of that arrow. And if that thing then turns out true, um, then keep that row. So, well, oops, it's, it's more convenient to write. It's nice and short, as well as being more efficient. Yes, sorry? This, I just couldn't hear you. Can we use this syntax for rows? Um, I mean, this is doing it per row, so I'm not sure what you mean by can you use it for rows. Uh, column. For columns. Um, no, I don't think this. So you mean it, you could like look at look at the first row and apply is odd to it, or I don't know. No, it's not really symmetrical. Um. Right. So if you would transpose the data frame, could you do like the same thing? No. So don't try and do that. <laughs> data frames are designed to have the names in the columns, like each column is named and each row is numbered. So you can't meaningfully transpose it. Um, at least I don't think anybody implemented anything. So normally the transpose operator would be, um, well, let's use transpose actually. Um, so that's the function to transpose a matrix, but it's just not defined. In fact, let's use permute dims. It's telling us to. I, I don't think this is going to work though, because <laughs> um, we might permute the first and second dimensions. I, I forget actually how to call this function. Yeah, no method. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe I just did that wrong, but I'm pretty sure that nobody's ever tried to implement that because generally speaking, like you want to like you want to work with data frames where the columns are named and the rows are numbered. That's just how it's designed to be used. Um yeah, but good question. Uh what were we up to? Oh yeah, I was just yeah, explaining what that funny syntax is about. Um 
Okay, that's fine. Okay, we, we did talk about what was going on behind the scenes here, um, but another way of looking at this uh, is to, you've got the first, you've got the A column, and then you can compute whether that's odd. Um, so this, remember this dot broadcasts, so it applies this odd to every element of that vector. So you get 101. And then you could use that bit vector to select out. This is another fancy bit of indexing syntax, actually. Um, you could use the bit vector to select out the things where this is true. Um, so every row where this is true, this vector of bits, um, trues and falses, uh, you could you could slice the data frame up this way if you wanted to. And then the colon again is to refer to the whole row. So yeah, that works as well. This is less efficient because this thing here eagerly constructs this vector of bits. Um, whereas you didn't really need to make that vector, you could just do the calculation, is this row true, and then put it into the result without keeping that whole vector of, of things. Okay, this is wrong, it should be is odd. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so yeah, it's just, it's just selecting out those ones where the bits are true. Yes. All uh, right, yeah, so what does it actually do? Did it do something? So that's very interesting. Oh, right. Okay. So, the, oh, that's really funny as well. So yeah, oh, this is great. So this, this is doing something really bizarre. Um, so yeah, DF, it was this thing. Um, you could swap it around. Um, so the thing though is that you, you will notice now it's made these names for the columns, X1, X2, X3. Um, those used to be indices to the rows, but it's just constructed these names. Um, and then it's thrown away the names of the original DF, which were A, B, and C, and just turned them into indices. Um, so it's like, technically this has done a thing, but it's probably not a thing you want to do. Um, another thing that's worth noting about that is that, see, originally we have this data frame and it has these nice well-defined types for every column. Um, and that's because it's, again, it's like column-based storage. So you're trying to put things all the same type into this column usually. Um, and Julia is able to like make that very efficient. It's storage is efficient and like, accessing it is efficient. But if you would flip this around, then um, it's still trying to make a column-based storage, but now it has to choose to like have an integer and a float and a string. So this is actually a really great example. Um, and it has, so that means, oh, well, like what's the super type of all those things? Well, it's any. So now we have this inefficient storage of columns where we just have like whatever. So yeah, don't permute data frames unless you really have to. <laughs> Um, I don't don't transpose them. Um, so I can think I guess that's like another indication that like it's actually better to view these things as a collection of rows. Like it's not really two-dimensional in some ways. It's just a nice way of laying it out. <laughs> um, okay, so um we had that example before where we could compute this group data frame and we calculated the number of um, things in each group. Um, I think, do we use select for that? We used, we used um, combine, I think it was. Anyway, so let's talk about how we can sort of summarize the data frame or like transform data frames. Um, so select is a pretty simple function where we can just select a subset of columns. Um, we could also select we can also compute something based on the existing columns and then put those into new columns. So, uh, um, yeah, so it's saying they can be renamed. You can rename the columns. So we could try that. So I think we can do this. I'm sure. Okay, cool. So yeah, we can use this. We're saying, oh, we're going to select rows A and C, but also um, row B is going to be transforms um, to, I forget what was in B, it was a floating point number. Um, so I don't know. Um, I think that works. No, I did it wrong. Do I need to add something here? Yeah, no, we'll, we'll get to an example where that actually works. Perhaps I should be using transform. Um, that will certainly work. Um, we have these, anyway, we have these three different um, functions for working with like 
treating the data frame. So, um, yeah, this one, so transform will will keep the existing columns. So let's use transform instead of select. Um, and it will allow you to compute something based on one of the columns. So that's what the syntax here means. It means take column B, um, compute the mean of that entire column, and then put it into mean B. So that's a bit strange, but it makes more sense when you come to grouped data frames. Um, so like, let's look at, in fact, that is not going to work. We need to do by row or something. Anyway, so yeah, like this one I was trying to do, we could do this way. So um, if we were to go, this other, yeah, okay, let, let's just use the example, which is over here. So um, statistics, we'll use that. So say we wanted to compute the mean of everything in the B column, that's what we'd get for this. And what it does is, well, there's only one value for that, but it's broadcasted down this column here. So it's always, it's the same value for all of these. Um, but this will make a bit more sense for groups where you would compute the mean on the group instead of on the entire data frame, I think. We should check that in a minute. Um, yeah, so you can see that as well, um, this original data frame is unmodified. So most of these functions should have an exclamation mark after them if they're a modifying version of it. Um, and in this case, we've got a new data frame with this extra column. And these values are all the same because this applies to the whole column. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, and if you would like to do that by um, just instead of doing it to the whole column, B, you'd like to do it for a row, then, oops, we can wrap it in this by row thing. Um, what are we going to call that? Um, B odd or something. Okay, there we go. It's too A. It's more interesting. Okay, that's that's at least got something which is different in it. Okay, yeah. So, um, this was just like nicely let you add things. Um add bits and pieces to your data frame, augment it with like new information. Um, and you can do more than one, add new more than one new column at a time. So this, for instance, you can apply the lowercase function to all of the C, the C like things in the C uh, column. And as I was saying, like these don't change the original data frame, um, but if you want to change this data frame and actually add columns to it, then you can do that by adding this little exclamation mark here which means modify it, please. So let's do, whoop, let's do that. If I can select it. So we just need this in a minute, so. Okay. So let's look at the F again. So now we've got this, oh, it's a bit too big. Um, now we've actually modified it. There you go. And yeah, this is lowercase. Okay. Um, oh, what? Sorry, where's the group that we had? Oh, I've I've missed something. <laughs> okay, skipped over a few things. Okay, so right, so we could also group by uh, the group this data frame by whether it's things are odd on A is odd or not. So we could do that. So now we have two groups, as they must be, um, no more than two. Um, and we can't see any of them. There we go, we can see them now. Okay. Um, so then once you have a grouped data frame like that, um, it makes a little more sense to do things where you apply um, a function to kind of the whole column, because it's actually applying it to the group rather than the entire thing. Um, so that's what we've got going here. So we can apply uh, the um, to the B column, we're going to add things, and to the C column, we're going to join them. Now, this join here is just Julia's join function, which joins strings together. So what we get out um, is 
or summary of each of these groups. It's not a very interesting one, um, but like we'll see a bit of a more interesting one in a minute. Um, so yeah, the summary is has basically been like we've added all the things in this group together, all of the B elements, and we have joined the strings together for some reason. <laughs> um, but yeah, you might want to compute the mean um, or all sorts of like statistical things, summaries of um, of each group. Um, yeah, so what we've seen here is that um, we've grouped the data by some attribute, and then we've applied some function to each group, and then we've put them all back together into this like resulting data set or data frame. And that's called the split apply combine strategy. Um, and it's a really common pattern in data analysis. So you'll see this all over the place. Um, I think there's maybe, a, I think it was a paper from the, the R programming language world or something where they originally talked about this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super common and super useful. Um, and yeah, so if you look up, if you look it up, then you will, you'll find literature about it. So we're going to go through in the join. Oh, okay. I actually think it might be a good time to sort of have a break. It's 5.50. So we'll have a break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back. On schedule today. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah, the tragedies of having a name which conflicts with <laughs> with data analysis terminology. <laughs> Sorry. The joys. <laughs> In a join, yeah. We'll talk about in a join in a minute. Yeah. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions. Or we can have a little chat, whatever. <laughs> you can plug in your laptop, yes. <laughs> Welcome to. <laughs> we need to bring extension cords. <laughs> See, it's just long enough. Yeah, I've learned my lesson and brought a charger so that I don't run out due to Zoom being an absolute battery hog. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, let's continue. Yeah, 601. Okay. So let's continue with the second half. <clears throat> right. So uh, for this little bit, um, so, but yeah, I don't think you're going to use this much, but we'll just just show how to do it um because it is extremely useful um we're going to talk about joining two data frames together so say you have one data frame which is this one here it has some identifiers ids <clears throat> um and this would be if people have the same name they can have different ids so you can uniquely identify them within the system um and so, yeah, this this will have potentially other things about this person um, in different columns, but we're just not going to throw those for this example. <clears throat> uh, and then say you had a, another another data frame, which is the jobs of all these people. Um, so if you have this situation and you want to know which person in this first data frame has which job, then you could do use this in a join function. So what this does is it matches up the IDs. So you can see that there's a row with, well, this is a person with an ID three here and there's no corresponding job. So maybe they don't have a job. There's someone um, in this table here with jobs where there's just no ID four in this other table as well. Um, so yeah, what you might want to do is match up all of these IDs together <clears throat> and then make a new data frame out of that where you have not only the names of people, but you have their jobs as well. So that's what inner join does. And so there we have it. <clears throat> now what's the inner bit? Well, that's about this kind of like idea of the ID has to match, but if sometimes you, you might want to do something else. So you can do an outer join or left or right join. There's different types of joins you can do. Um, this isn't really in the notes, but I'm just, it, it might be, you know, you might ask the question, what's that inner about? Um, so yes, you're joining two tables together, but the inner bit is like you only take things which are in both tables in both sides. So you, you could do an outer join. This is a lot less common. Um, and in that case, there's a job which is missing. This this person doesn't have a job, and there's a name which is missing. This job doesn't have doesn't have a, a, the person associated with it. Maybe that's an indication the data is broken, or maybe there's just nobody doing being a farmer at the moment. Although it's a little strange that there'd be an ID in the system for that. Um, so does anybody know why we wouldn't just put these jobs? Like, why wouldn't you just put them in the original data frame? So like this one up here, why wouldn't just put job, why wouldn't, we, why wouldn't we just put the jobs in there? Sorry, sorry. Did... Oh, they could be from different data sets. Yes, they could be from different sources. Another reason could be that exactly one person can have multiple jobs or someone can have no job. So, okay, if the no job case is kind of easy to accommodate in this original data frame. Because um, we could just use a missing value in that case. Um, but when you have multiple jobs, that's not quite so easy to accommodate. You could have a vector like a, a, in each um, in each one of those um, like job cells in the data. But um, that tends to be like kind of inefficient because you've got this ragged length. Um, like there's an unknown number of things in each of those slots. It's a bit like less efficient to store. Um, so yeah, like for that first case, let's actually make that happen. Um, so what do we need to have? We want, no, no, that's the other way around. So jobs. So like this person too could have like another job as well. So like, I don't know, they can be a lecturer. Fine. Um, so in that case, if we do the join, um, in a join. So now we've got that Jane has is appearing two times in this, and that makes that's fine. She's allowed to do that. Um, and is both of those things has to do, the jobs are in there twice. 
Um, yeah, so that could be useful depending on what kind of data analysis you're trying to do. Um, and that's just like, I think we kind of talked about this a little bit at the um, very start of this unit when we're talking about relational data. And there was that kind of picture of Bill Gates and the different tables and how they relate. Um, so yeah, you can have multiple entries in some cases. And this is like a convenient way to store the data and yeah, kind of ask questions about it, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's there's other types of drawings, but yeah, all relational data kind of analysis stuff. Okay, so let's make some graphs and stuff. Um, and you'll be doing a bit of this in your project. So we're going to go back to the Olympic athlete data set. Um, so do I still have that? Yeah, okay. So I've still got this athlete data frame with um, like 100,000 rows in it, 130,000. Um, so yeah, we could do this thing here. So um, can anyone tell me what that's? Well, I can see. You, of course you can because it's, it's like written there, but... Um, what's going on here is like we're calculating this a bit vector um, to select all the sex equals m, and then we are calculating or indexing the values where that's true. We're getting the height out, and then we're calculating the mean. <clears throat> um, so yeah, let's do that. Oh, we got missing. So. <clears throat> Um, missing is designed to kind of pollute data. So if you try and calculate the mean of, and you've got a missing value in there, then it will end up missing. Like after you've summed everything up, you you have missing. So missing plus one. I think, I, I hope this is correct. Yes. Okay. So this is current design. Um, yeah. So missing kind of pollutes computations and forces you to decide what to do about missing values. So you can't kind of forget to deal with the missings. You decide, you've got to decide whether to drop them. And that's one thing you could do. So we could drop all the missings and we could use skip missing for that. So that this, this would do that. Um, and likewise, we could do the same for the women. Okay. <clears throat> um, another thing that's like not really covered in the notes, but I'd like to mention is data pipelines. Um, so this is something you'll see a lot in data analysis. And I think like if you look at this expression here, I would say there's something dissatisfying about it. It's almost like we have to read it the wrong way around. We've got to look at what's going on over here. Then we look at this thing. Then we look at this. And then we look at that. Because of the way that function calls work, you kind of work more the way towards the left to figure out what's being done. But you might want to view that as a pipeline of processing stages. Um, so let's like do that instead and we'll see how that works out. So, and this first little bit's not that convenient in this syntax to do it. Uh, let's just start with this maybe. So this is all the heights. Um, so, you know, let, let's go all the way back. So we'll go... So we start off with this data frame, and then the first processing step is to filter it. So we're really looking for um, all the like filtering by the sex. And we're in fact, we might want to group that. So remember this, um, and again, apologize for the font weirdness here, but this is just these two characters joined together. Um, so we might want to filter that. Um, by the sets, the athletes. <sighs> okay, uh, how are we going to do this? I sort of want, like, I want a better example. Let me have a look. I think there's more. There's another one that's slightly better in a minute. It's not there. Okay, I'll just, I'll just do this one. <clears throat> Um, so remember the filter function has um, a special version for, um, for 
for data frames. So that was, uh, how's it go? Yeah, we, we want to go, um, what was it, sex? And we want to filter by um, this being equal to M. Okay. So that's one way of writing it. And as I was saying, you, you kind of like end up with a situation where you're like adding all of the functionality on the left here. So um, instead of that, we can we can use this package called underscores .jl, which I wrote. Um, you can use one of the other ones. There's several packages which make filtering syntax, like sort of pipelining syntax more like pleasant to write. You might use pipes.jl or you might use um, datapipes.jl. I would probably recommend um, for like one that's currently being used by a lot of people, maybe data pipes, um, or you can use underscores, which is kind of a finished package. Um, I wouldn't say it like achieves all the things um, that you might want, um, but anyway, so you try and write out this example. So the idea with piping is you're going to start with some data and you're going to pipe it into an operation. So the operation is filter, and then we want to go. Um, Um, this was equal to M. And what this at underscore macro does is allow you to write placeholders in this. So what we're wanting to do is put this data into this placeholder here, right? Um, so you might've seen like in other areas, in other places in mathematics where people will talk about have functions having slots and they might put, they might talk about, you know, you haven't filled the slot up. So it's a partially applied function. So I might use a dot or an underscore or something else to say that there's this like this place in the function needs to be filled. Um, so that's what this double underscore is. Um, it's saying that this thing is going to be put into here. So we could do that. Um, so filter by, oops, where are we? There we go. So first, the first that's the next step. We're filtering by a six. Um, and the great thing is you can keep adding these these pipelines onto the end of this the phase processing steps. Um, so maybe in this case, we only care about the height. We're not wanting this whole data frame. So we're just going to get a vector out. So again, we're putting the result data frame from this filtering operation into uh, something that gets just the height column out of that. So now we've got this column. Um, we've got this single column. Um, and uh, now we want to skip the missings. Um, the, the other thing you might notice here is that like we can look at the result from this out this thing every time and we have a look oh yes there's some missings in there okay we better skip the missings um so then we have this this is the, the uh, not this is not actually um this is an iterator over this other array which skips the missings so that's why this is written this way so if we wanted to um make that concrete then we would use collect um but generally we wouldn't need to do that because the next step we're going to do is take the mean um Okay, so then in this case, then you can just sort of read it from kind of left, if you like, or top to bottom, and you can just look at all the processing steps that have happened. And personally, I find that to be a lot more satisfying when you're doing data analysis to write pipelines. Um, so yeah, I recommend um, trying out underscores.jl or datapipes.jl. Um, there's actually several of these packages because nobody can agree on what the perfect package is for this thing. <laughs> Um, and in fact, we'd like to have this in base, um, some kind of placeholders like these underscores, but nobody can agree um, on what they should be because it's a really hard design problem. Um, so there, there's like a, there's an issue on the Julia GitHub um, page with like 400 comments discussing how underscores should work and nobody and nobody's managed to agree yet. So I don't know if we're ever going to agree. Um, I sort of have hope remaining, but um, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Anyway, okay, yeah. So all of the examples in the notes, I think, don't use pipelines like this. But um, it is a very, it is a very kind of nice syntax, I would say, when you're playing around with data. Okay. Um, what else did I want to do here? Oh, and I guess I should, I could say as well that like there was this version of filter um, that takes a row. Um, 
And so if you're taking a row, you can use this single underscore that you can think of as a, so the double underscore is the thing which is coming in from the left, the whole collection, and the single underscore is one of the rows. So you could just say the sex dot underscore sex. So the rows sex is equal to M. Um, so that would do the same thing. Um, so that's also like the both of these different types of underscores are like enabled by this this having this macro out the front. So this goes through and processes the syntax and the rest of this expression. <clears throat> Um, and just turns this into a pile of um, of lambda functions. But yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So so, but like this, the output of this analysis. Like, let's think about that. Um, we've we can see that yes, there's ten centimeters higher for all of the um, male athletes. Um, about on average. Um, so yeah, like. Another question we could ask about this data is have people, has athletes height changed over time? What do you reckon, class? <laughs> What's that? You reckon it might have increased? Why do you think so? Nutrition has improved a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So very plausible. Yeah. So let's see, find out if that's true. Um, so right, in this case, we're going to group by um, group by sex instead. So now we'll have two groups, and this will be a bit more convenient. We can do the whole analysis, and we can have both groups in the in the result. Um, so again, I'm going to maybe transform this. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's an obscure way of writing it, but very neat. Okay, so <laughs> let's just let's just get this. So grouping them by um, sex, and then. Um, then we use the combine function. Um, so to remind you what this meant, I think we we did talk about this a minute ago. Um, we're taking the height column um, and we're computing this function on the entire group. And then this is going to become the new height. Um, so if we do that, we've got this tiny little data frame out. Um, it's quite neat. Um, and this function here, uh, this is this is mathematical composition. So it means skip all the missings and then compute the mean. Um, and you can write that little circle with backslash circ. Like that. <laughs> it's got three methods. Um, yeah, but that just that that just like computes a new function out of two existing functions, um, which is their composition. The, the new function is the composition of the old ones. Okay, fine. We've we've got this tiny summary data frame out of it. So let's use the plots package to show what that looks like. Oh, we don't have enough. Actually, see that? Yeah. Oh no, it's done this again. Wait a bit. <laughs> Select those ones. Oh come on. <laughs> what happens? Ridiculous. Okay. That's just whoa. Okay. Um. Okay. So we've got this font. We've got this um <clears throat> plot, which sort of shows a fair bit of noise, but it's not really showing much of a trend. Um, so that's like our initial, maybe that's our initial like look at there. We're like, oh, that's a bit surprising. Kind of would have expected people maybe to go a bit taller as like conditions in general improved. Like 1900, that was pretty, that's a long time ago. And if you have that like kind of thought, then maybe it's time to dig into the data a bit more and see whether that's actually like whether we're really seeing like the um, the, the reality of what's going on. Okay, so the issue here is confounding factors. So there's other things which are changing in the data which make this make it look like there's no change in this particular variable. But <clears throat> um, we're going to dig in a bit more and we'll see. Okay, so there's yeah, there's one strange thing first of all, which is <clears throat> um, the the gears changed. Um, the 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 um, 
increment between well that they yeah olympics used to be every four years um and then they're now every two years due to the winter olympics moving to the other years okay so we could plot instead of plotting this what we did before um why is it actually i'm a bit confused about what's going on there with that one but let's plot this out again by oh right okay yes okay great so let's plot let's plot them why does that happen it's so annoying <laughs> why this happens stop oh there we go <laughs> okay so yeah we can group by um the season so before we were grouping by the year um but now we're also grouping by the season the summer or winter so in fact we should look at that data frame and see what's in there so let's have a look at that one um so yeah this one's how many groups has it got? 51 groups based on the year and the season. So in each of these groups is now going to be a distinct year and season. So um, we're not going to have the summer and winter groups together. Um, and if we were to plot that, um, then we get this, this graph instead. So we've split the summer and the winter apart. <clears throat> okay. So yeah, perhaps the type of sport effects um, the height of the, the competitors. Uh, so perhaps we should split those, split those. In fact, we should probably split them further. Um, I'm not sure that this data has that in it though. So let's get Yeah, it does have the sport. Um, like we could try to drill down to the individual sports, but we might not have enough data. So that's also another thing though that you should definitely try and do if you have this data set would be to drill down to particular sports. Um, but um, we don't need to go that far in this case. Um, so like a much bigger factor that's happened here is actually that um, the participation by women has gone up a lot. The proportion of women participating in the Olympics has gone up a lot over the time um, that these records were kept. Um, and the women, as we saw before, are shorter. So that should be a downward trend in the heights of people. Um, if there was nothing else going on, we, we should be actually seeing a downward trend. Um, so yeah, having taken into account those confounding factors. Um, so let's group by not just the year and the season, but also the, the sex field. Um, so now we have... 101 different groups that we've got here. And yeah, then we're going to height, compute this height by cohort, which is again, just a mean. Um, so this is a pretty small data frame, 101 um, for all these different groups. And then we've just got the mean again for each of those. Um, so you can see we now have the year and the season and the sex and that's and then we have the height of the people in that group. Oh, we have some nans. What's going on there? That is actually not great. Uh, it's possible there was nobody who was competing. I'm not sure. Um, in this case, we it's probably just not even plotting that. So I'm not sure if that's a real problem when we're going to plot it, but that's probably something to look into as well. It's like, why do we have nans not a numbers in this data set? Um, yeah, probably something to look at. Again, that's a case of like data cleaning. Here we go. <laughs> a case that you might need to clean up the data before you do analysis on it. Okay, so we could plot that. Um, well, actually the plot's gonna be the same as that one, presumably. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, now that we've we've kind of removed those factors, um, if we look at these four different cases, um, so for instance, the um, the blue line being the women in the Summer Olympics or the, the green line being the women in the Winter Olympics, um, you can see there's like a pretty clear trend. Who knows what happened here? Maybe it's noise. Maybe there's something else going on. Um, but yeah, there's basically an upward trend in all those categories. Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. Like, And that's a pretty um, 
kind of classic example of uh, if you if you don't take into account some of the confounding factors, then you might get the wrong idea about the data. And not only can you can like you see a trend disappear, but you could even see it go backwards. Um, so like say that the imagine in this data set that um, for some reason it was ninety percent women now competing in the Olympics. <laughs> then um, you would probably see that actually the heights have decreased over time. And so if you looked at the whole data in aggregate, then you would get completely wrong idea about the trend. Um, <laughs> and that's a, this like classic, um, there's an actual name for that paradox in statistics where you can get the complete wrong idea about the trend by not taking into account some of the, now they're not like grouping by the right thing, basically. I forgot the name of that though, but it's a, it's a classic thing in statistics. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So there's like some kind of speculation on here about like why that might be. Well, okay, nutritional changes, especially. That's, that seems like highly likely to be one of the main things. Um, and sport has changed a lot over these years as well. Um, also, I mean, it's become like a thing you do professionally. Um, back in 1900, I don't think there would have been much of that. Maybe people had patrons or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, um, and we've certainly seen that there's a lot more women. Um, and yeah, uh, the winter competitions have certainly become um, more like recognized than all the people in those competitions. And apparently those people are shorter. So for instance, we would compare um yeah so yeah the guys in the summer versus the winter and the women in um the summer versus the winter i'm just checking just to make sure i'm saying the right thing but yeah that's right so um yeah for maybe for some reason the types of sports that are in the winter olympics um uh like it's it's actually an advantage to be sure relatively Okay, um, it's saying that we could verify number three. We certainly could. Um, so we're going to compute. Oh, that's an interesting expression. We should have a look at what's going on with that one. Okay, what's up? What's going on here? So okay, we're taking the sex column and Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So we have this grouped data frame, right? It's um, athlete by games. <clears throat> um, and then we're counting. So what we're going to do is apply this function here. So it takes the sex. And this is like not just the sex of an individual competitor, but it's the whole group um, for that particular games. Um, and it's counting the number of women and then dividing by the length of all the number of competitors. Um, so yeah, it's just computing the the fraction, <clears throat> and it's saving the result of that into this new column, fraction female. Okay. And yeah, we could plot that. Um, um, well, we can just see the plot here. So if we do that, um, what are we seeing? <laughs> Okay, this is the fraction of fraction of female athletes um, out of all of athletes um, over time. So for the summer and the winter games. And yeah, it's gone up a lot, which is great. Um, yeah, and we could have certainly gotten the wrong conclusion by just like looking at our first plot and going, oh, oh, well, I guess the things we thought maybe about it were wrong. Oh, well, let's continue. Right, so let's look at some histograms. Um, so above all of the things we're looking at above, we're just um, we're just calculating the mean of the people's people's um, height. But we could want to maybe we don't want to know the distribution. Um, so let's have a look at that. So just want to look at what are we even computing here? That's quite a one liner. <laughs> Okay, well let's like let's let's run it and then we will we'll break it down. 
Oh yeah, that's all sorts of stuff going on there. <laughs> that is awful. <laughs> let's let's run it. <laughs> and then we'll look through what it actually does. So yeah, we get this single histogram out. Um, then we can run histogram. You can notice there's an exclamation mark here. This will plot a new plot over the existing one. That's how we get this kind of thing here. So we can run that one as well. And then we'll have a look at what's actually going on in that big expression. Okay, um, we've got this nice plot. Um, okay, what's going on here? So, yeah, I guess this is like another example of things kind of looking backwards. Um, so we've got a particular year that we're actually looking at. So, or group, I guess. So this, this that's this thing here. So we're looking at 2016. Um, remember that this athlete by cohort, um, we've looked at three different things to group by. So we've looked at the year and whether it's summer or winter and then the sex. So that's, we've got that one. Um, then we're indexing this group data frame by that. So that'll just give us this one single um, sub data frame, this one single group. Um, and what else we've got here? Oh, we're pulling out just the height from that. Uh, and what else have we got? We need to skip the missings and then we're going to collect. So the collect function takes something which is an iterator and returns a vector from it. So um, skip missing just returns. It, it doesn't eagerly compute anything. It just wraps the vector that it's been given with something with, with like a lazy operation, which says when someone tries to get something out of this, check whether it's missing or not. Um, so, so basically it's a filter. Okay. Uh, and then on top of all of that, there's just some plotting stuff to make the pretty the picture pretty um, and label the axes and stuff like that. Okay, so and I might just like write that the other way um, to like <laughs> do the do the data pipes thing again. So we like would select that group potentially, and what do we want to do? Get their height, get the height from that. Whoop. Sorry, get the height from that group, and then we would skip the missings. Whoop. And we do a syntax error. <laughs> okay, and each stage of this, of course, we can check whether we're doing something, we're seeing something sensible. Um, and then we maybe want to collect it. And I think that's only required because histogram is expecting a vector and not some kind of lazy iterator. Okay, so so yeah, we can we could write it that way if we wanted to. Okay. Um, and the histogram is really useful. Um, if if you're just computing summaries like the the mean, um, then you might miss something really important about the data often. Um, so like if the shape of the distribution is really strange, say you had two peaks and they were quite widely separated, that might, I mean, maybe that would be surprising in this case for height, but you know, ne never know. Um, that might be a sign that something interesting is going on about the data and you actually want to investigate why that's happening. Um, or it might, it might be a sign that like you're making wrong assumptions when you're doing data analysis on top of it. So it can be really useful to look at, just like a quick look at the distribution that you've got. Um, the histogram function is a really good way to do that. <clears throat> um, okay, and then there's like sort of some examples here of like other things we could ask up data. Um, like, and these would be good questions, like that if they, that might go through your mind as a data analysis type person. Um, so like, does the socioeconomic factor, like factors, um, uh, so GDP per capita, how does that relate to team success? Um, like do richer countries do better than poorer countries? That would be very unsurprising if that was true. Um, even just in terms of access to people going to the Olympics, you really expect this would be true. Um, so, 
yeah, another thing would be like, does does it help to be like how much does it help to have to be in the home, like on your home soil? Um, so Australia got a lot of medals in the 20, then the 2000 um, Olympics. Um, yeah, and and then like you could ask some, so those are just kind of like looking at the data and trying to ask questions that exist within it, but you could also ask to like predict things maybe. Um, so you might want to know like which team's going to do well next Olympics. Um, of course, a lot of people are going to want to know that. <laughs> um and yeah, that that would be definitely heading in the direction of machine learning. Um, and it says we'll cover that. I don't think there's notes about this. So I don't know why it says that. <laughs> oh, was it? Okay. So maybe it's just that this has been rearranged. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense, actually. Um, although I think also some, mm, I think some content might have been removed from this course. So yeah, that yeah. that little note um, will have to be fixed up. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. There was. I think the course was even bigger in previous years. So like, if you think there's lots this year, <laughs> there was more. <laughs> yes, it's been cut down a little bit. Um, okay, we we are getting towards the end of the material here. Um, no, that's okay. There's not that much time left. <clears throat> um, okay, and so I, I guess there's like there's this this comment here about what is what counts as well, like how how do you deal with data when it's large and stuff? So <clears throat> in this case, we have small data. It's easily fitting in the memory of the computer. Um, you just load it up. You have it in a single data frame, and you just process it all at once. Um, <clears throat> and that's very typical. So like as a data scientist, something this would be very often the case. You will actually have small data. I mean, you don't need anything fancy. You can just use the Julia wrapper or like a Python notebook or something like that. Um, I would say the next the next one is kind of a, I don't know, these are kind of, these are all kind of fuzzy mm -hmm. categories in some ways. Um, so you could sort of look at medium data as data that's too big for to be just all loaded up into RAM, but there's you have this disk, say, and it's like five terabytes or something on your machine and it's full of data. Um, so in that case, you would want to potentially read um, a piece of data, like uh, a few gigabytes worth of data from the disk and do a bit of processing on that. Um, and uh, then like write the results back to disk, then do the next bit. So that's also a common thing to encounter. Um, I guess the last time I encountered something like that was medical um, imaging data where we had uh, a pile of images of people's brains and uh, each one of those easily fitted in, in the computer's memory. Um, so you just load up the, the set of images for that individual patient and you do some processing and you write them back to disk and then you, you do the next one. Um, so yeah, that's pretty common to have as well. <clears throat> um, and yeah, there's like a note here that, that an SQL database are often in that category. Um, not always, but very common. Um, and then there, there's like this been this big kind of hype about big data. It's probably over by now, like by several years at least. Um, but um, it's sort of like the idea of this is like you have too much data to deal with, with in some way with one machine. So it could be that you have too much, that, that like the processing is too heavy. So like you can fit all the data on the machine, but you have to do so much processing on each piece that you really need to farm it out to a whole bunch of machines. Um, and or like alternatively, it could just be that you cannot literally fit that amount of, there's not enough, you can't plug enough disks into the machine to like actually have all that data, um, on one machine. So, um, that, that's also like kind of common, um, not as, not nearly as common though, as like the other two cases really, I um, in practice. Um, yeah. And in that case, you need an entire cluster or maybe you buy some like compute from, um, Amazon or Azure one of these cloud services and do the compute there. Um, yeah. And and it's it's actually funny. There's a comment here that uh, there's a first person comment here at the bottom, but also applies to me because I worked with Andy who wrote these notes um, <laughs> that, yeah, in, in a previous job, we had a lot of LiDAR data um, and we're using that to model, um, model Queensland and other places in the world. 
And we definitely had big data in that case. Um, like the first data, the first part of that data pipeline ended up being like four petabytes or something by the time I left. Um, so like if you have, it's it's like it's like a thousand hard like largest hard disks you can buy kind of thing. So it's, it's quite a lot, um, and it's also typical that in that case you would have the data pipeline will condense the data downwards. So like every stage of processing, you'll kind of funnel the data down and get a lot less. And at the very end of that job that we used to do, we would give them a spreadsheet, which is like the most depressing thing. <laughs> We have all this lovely data about like all this special data about Queensland. And then um, at the end, we'd be like, here's a spreadsheet. These are all the places you need to go and in in like your in your little like um area to cut the trees down. And these are the like these are the coordinates of those. Um <laughs> and the reason for that is just funny. They um they they had a, a the the customer had a lot of business process built on top of spreadsheets and they like spreadsheets so we gave them a very fancy but ultimately just a spreadsheet <laughs> anyway um it says there's a practical REFL demonstration I don't know what Andy had in mind here <laughs> but we basically run out of time anyway so that's fine um I thought one thing we could do I've already covered um underscores a bit and data pipelines which is not in these notes um, but I also wondered if we should try to set up iJulia. Now, has any have you used the iPython like sort of notebook system yet in this course? Anyone? Jupyter, yeah. Was that in any previous assignments or? Okay, cool. All of them. Yeah. Not the pr project. Not the anyway. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, great. So you've done that already. Awesome. Um, so yeah, we don't need to go through that then. I think we kind of like we kind of we kind of reached the end of these notes. So um, the uh, the one option is to go back to um, a couple of sort of efficiency things from um, unit seven. Um, alternatively, we can just maybe just call it an early day, and we'll decide what to do tomorrow. <laughs> this is the last lecture. Any questions? I think that's the option I'm taking. I'll be here. <laughs> we have reached the end of these notes. Um, so I'll have a chat to Yoni about what else there is. There is definitely stuff from Unit 7, which um, I kind of glossed over. So we could go back to that. Um, and I would definitely like to talk a little bit about efficiency. So I think that was one thing that was missed out and for no particular reason in unit seven was there was a, a little tiny section about um, how to make your Julia programs fast if they're not fast enough. So I'd definitely like to talk about that. So I'll talk about that tomorrow um, and possibly a couple of other things. Simpson's paradox, is that the one about you get the wrong correlations? Yeah, thank you, yeah. So that's what we're talking about before where the sex, like the height could go. Yeah, exactly that picture. Yeah. Yeah. Simpsons paradox. Yes, question. Yeah, and it's a very big big take a long time, but the concept manager I know that only a few CPU ports are actually on about ninety or hundred and those are just Right, yeah. So, okay, the question for anyone who's on chat is uh, what about parallel processing? <laughs> so, why doesn't Julie use all the cores? Um, so, there's the main reason is that most uh, well by default like the semantics of julia are like kind of single threaded mostly like some of the functions you could make multi-threaded and there's a few which are so if you're doing really heavy ma matrix like um manipulations so matrix solves matrix i don't know about matrix multiply but um certainly like matrix solves and factorizations um the library that julia uses uh, underneath to do those things is multi-threaded so in that case, you would get all of the cores being used. Um, and the reason for that is that you kind of ask Julia to do this one task 
Um, and yeah, that, like the, the underlying library has been multi-threaded as well, but um, it's kind of a very high level question, like do this matrix factorization. Um, and so um, like in that case, it's been worthwhile for someone to um, yeah, go, go along and like multi-thread the back end, which does those matrix factorizations and stuff. Um, so yeah, like in some cases, if the library underneath that you're using is multi-threaded, then you'll see it using all of the cores. Um, but otherwise, um, it's not, it's not a trivial program transformation to turn your serial code. So when you write some code, the semantics, like the meaning of that code is in, is imperative in Julia. Like it's just a list of steps, right? So whether it's not a trivial transformation for the compiler to go from here's a list of steps to do to then deciding which steps can be done at the same time. Yes, question. If the computer, OPA for computer, uh, turning machine with the code that you're using here. Is it a Turing machine? Yeah. I mean, it's Turing complete. Um, so Turing machine itself is like a mathematical abstraction mainly. Um, it's a certain way of defining what it means to compute something. Um, <clears throat> and as far as anybody can tell, every model of computation is equivalent to Turing machines, but no actual computer, a real computer is built on the model which of, of the Turing machine. <clears throat> Real computers have um, other things that Turing machines don't have, I guess. So, like, make a practice would actually build them. Um, sorry, so I've lost track of where we were going with that question. So, so how is that related to like parallelization? I mean, unless there's a automated transformation for given a Turing machine, here's a parallel Turing machine, which does the same thing as that Turing machine, but can run in parallel. And I'm guessing that that's not the case. Like there's no such transformation, which is easy to make. It's like what you're really asking for. And when you're asking for like, um, please compile it, just make my code run in parallel. What you're asking for it to do is to take apart the semantics of your program. <clears throat> and in the particular order you told it to do things in, um, and so like the meaning of that program has to be analyzed enough that it, the, the compiler can understand which parts can be done at the same time. And because the semantics of Julia code is serial, like this thing, then this thing, then this thing, it's very non-obvious to decide that yes, this thing and this thing, even though they're on different lines and there's other stuff in between, they can actually be done together. So what I'm saying is that you need in general to write your code with multi-threading in mind it's not magic. You can't just have it magically use all the threads. <laughs> um, and there's definitely ways to do that. Yes. So if you want to know more about that, you can look at the threads macro. Um, that's, whoa, um, thread call? Uh, what is it called? Um, I thought it was app threads. No, I've, I've forgotten. Um, need to look it up. There's certainly tasks as well, um, there's, and there's spawn. So if you want to do something in parallel, you can use at spawn, and that will make a new thread, basically. Um, and that will act in parallel with any other thing that you're doing. So um, uh, whoops, oh, come on. Oh, I'm, I prob this is probably a new thing. Um, yeah, okay. This is being put. Okay, we're getting that. <laughs> okay. Let's keep pulling on this thread just a little bit more and then we'll finish. Okay, so um pun intended. Um so there's the threads. Um it's not a standard library, it's built into base. I think that's why I needed the dot. Um so threads dot. Yeah, so that's where spawn comes from. So if you want to do spawn, if you want to do something in parallel, um, this is like a very stupid kind of example of that, but um, uh, yeah, the, like let's put a loop here. Uh, we'll do a for loop so it doesn't go forever. Um, yeah. 
so we can do this for instance. Um, so what's going to happen now is it's going to annoyingly print high into my terminal, even though I'm trying to do other stuff. Um, and it's keeping on doing it until it goes up to 10. So, so even though I'm typing some other things, it's been in the background and in parallel, in fact, because this machine has four cores, um, it is doing other stuff. So yeah, like spawn is for what you, what I would call unstructured parallelism. So if you need, if you have um, one task that you want to do, which is completely unrelated to some other task, um, then spawn is a good tool for the job. Um, sometimes you might just have an array and you want to do one thing to every element in that array and the ordering of doing those things doesn't matter. That's very common. Um, in that case, you could use the other macro, which I've forgotten the name of. Um, uh, yes, at threads, it was just inside the threads, um, the threads module. That's why I wasn't getting it before. Okay, so this just makes a parallel for loop. So you have you have some kind of for loop with some stuff inside of it, and you want to do all of the things, you want to do the lines in that for loop, and you want to do them in parallel, you can use the threads macro for that. Um, so this is quite limited. It only gives you, it only does a very specific set of types of things in parallel, but um, it's also very easy to use. So this is like one option. Um, I did something called pmap as well, um, which allows you to map things in parallel, um, which is quite similar to this in some ways. Um, yeah, and the spawn at spawn is kind of like the general tool that you could use to make these other tools on top of. So at threads is built on top of um, uh, the infrastructure, which at spawn is related to, I guess we could say that. Um, so yeah, there's definitely ways to do it. Um, uh, some of them are easier than others. If you can get away with using at threads, then maybe you should do that because it's super easy. Um, yeah. Um, and if you want to do it on multiple machines, there's also a library called distributed. Um, and you can use that to connect to other machines and run tasks on those ones. Um, and yeah, that is relatively easy to use um, in a kind of limited setup. And if you want something which is higher level than that, there's something called dagger.jl, um, which is for directed acyclic graphs. That's the, the pun of the name. So yeah. Great question. Thank you. <laughs> it's a good way to end the lecture. Um, yeah, so like, let's kind of end it there. Um, more questions are cool. Um, but yeah, I'll just shut down the Zoom for now. Oh, yes, someone said thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Um, oh, sorry, someone's chatted something earlier, which I didn't catch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I will be here tomorrow telling you a bit about efficiency um, and hopefully some other interesting things. We'll, I'll have to think about it because we've reached the end of these set of notes. <laughs> okay, see you later. That was to chat.